Brilliant. Thank you um, very much indeed. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be listening to um, uh, all the talks uh, today. Um, and I've been listening to the way in which uh, digital technologies kind of filter into some of the, um, the conference presentations. Um, and I've been noticing, uh, for example, in relation to children's rights to um, uh, be heard, their rights to um, expression. Um, there are papers here I know about creativity, about how um, digital technologies can uh, support children's health. Um, a, ho a whole host of different ways. So um, I want to reflect really on what it means that children and young people are growing up in a digital world and very much think about it within, within a rights framework. Um, and uh, as Andrew said, I'm a social psychologist and I did begin um, my research with children and young people when uh, parents were facing decisions about whether to put a television in the bedroom and where to put the home PC when it first came home. So I've been doing this for a while. And one thing I realise is um, at, when I was beginning and when those were the debates, actually the Convention on the Rights of the Child was um, being adopted in, in 1989. And um, little did we realise at the same time, or did I certainly didn't make the connection at the same time that the world wide web was also being invented and these two things are um, I sometimes think on a kind of um, a collision course really as technology has become more and more important in in children and young people's lives so I want to begin with um, a couple of the well, well, some of the ways in which uh, children and technology are popularly thought of not necessarily in here but out there so out there um, where I I and many others uh, try to take research into uh, interaction with um, policy makers, governments, um, uh, regulators, and indeed the tech industry itself, there are two kinds of big debates. And one is about um, the harms that technology does to children and young people, and um, the revelations from the Facebook files uh, uh, last year, I think it was, um, that the companies actually know that they are damaging children's um, mental health, young people's mental health, uh, was a kind of interesting wake-up call uh, for many, even though um, uh, actually we knew this already in a sense, but also, of course, it's more complex than that. It depends on the circumstances, and actually Instagram's research was quite poor, uh, as it also turned out. Um, there's also a much, um, in a way, a kind of much bigger um, drive to make a connection between the young audience and the commercial world and to see young people as a market. And there is again a kind of voice of um, uh, practitioners, policy makers, researchers who are seeking to understand and in many ways to uh, temper, uh, if not um, prevent, some of that kind of commercial exploitation. So, so we have a, a, um, a, a kind of situation, you know, I think many of us here sitting with a, a child rights, human rights kind of hat on. Um, but out there, the debates really are about how do we prevent harm to children? And that the instinct then is to wrap children up in a very kind of safe world. Um, I like the quote about not letting children... Um, uh, Go, walk to school or go out and play or kind of be outside on their own for one minute. Many parents feel that about digital technologies. They should not let their children be on their own with the tech for um, one, one moment. And they look back to the good old days, I promised Andrew, the good old days of cutting turf on the bog, I believe, when um, children were free and happy and all was good. Um, <laughs> And, um, and then there's a second driver, and it is a commercial one, and many of our, our governments and policymakers are actually um, quite keen to let tech um, rip and do its thing, um, come what may, it might mean for children, because it's a huge uh, profit to the state, and I say that in this country especially. Um, so, um, so the Convention on the Rights of the Child... Um, uh, sorry, I realise you can't um, read what all the um, rights are, but I'm assured that everyone here knows them all off by number um, uh, backwards anyway, and, and I'm sure you do. Um, but I was thinking as I, as I looked at the abstract programme that um, people here are talking about lots of the different rights to, as I said, to expression, to health and to education, 
um, and to play and so forth. And all of those now are happening in a digital context, not only, but significantly so. And those days when parents... Um, worried about whether to you know, put a, a TV in your bedroom or where to put the computer, were still uh, ways of thinking about using technology as a kind of a, uh, a luxury good, a privileged extra, uh, uh, something that you could add to your child's life. Whereas now, I think we are living in a world in which technology has become infrastructural to, to so many parts of our, our lives, and we saw that very clearly in relation to uh, the pandemic. Uh, so what I want to um, do uh, in my remarks today uh, is give you a sense of some of the work that I and many others have been doing in relation to, um, it's, it's blasphemous to call it um, updating the Convention on the Rights of the Child for the Digital Age, but um, a number of us have been working on uh, the latest general comment, general comment 25, um, which... Um, applies to the digital world. I think that's my next, um, uh, yeah, well, okay, not quite my next slide. Um, and so I want to talk about the, the, what the general comment says and related to some of the research I've been, I've been doing. Um, I love this photograph, um, and I love this photograph because it's the kind of puzzle that I often hear from parents and policymakers. Kids are staring at their phones. Uh, we don't know what's going on. Probably they're wasting their time or doing something wrong, um, and there's a kind of silent stare that drives um, many adults mad, but reminds um, those of us in this community, I think, that what we need to do is to understand from that young person's perspective what is going on, and is this an opportunity, and is this a risk, and um, she's smiling slightly, so perhaps she's actually connecting with um, friends, or perhaps she's... Um, uh, Maybe she's not, maybe she's thinking thoughtfully, um, but we need to get her perspective before we can really understand what, what that means um, to her. So the question in my mind is how do we, how do we make the rights of, in, in the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, apply, as it were, on that small screen? And thinking about that problem has taken me uh, out of my comfort zone from the, the world of social psychology and young people's lives to talk to technologists, to talk to lawyers, to talk to um, uh, a, a range of policy makers uh, who are not always very knowledgeable about anything to do with children, uh, or if they know a lot about children, uh, forgive me, but do not always know very much about technology. And so there's a lot of kind of bridging that, that needs to be done to think about how we can turn that kind of maxim of if it's, a, if it's a right, it's a right online as well as offline, but actually how do we turn that maxim into um, something uh, that is effective. So I've spent a lot of um, my recent few years working um, with uh, a small drafting team led um, by the Five Rights Foundation, working with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child to draft General Comment 25. Uh, and it came out last year, as you can see, uh, and um, I think it's a brilliant 10,000 words, actually 11,720 or something. Um, I always run a little over. Mm. And um, it does try to... It's, it's broadly organised by, um, by, by the sort of traditional groupings of the... Uh, rights um, of the convention and it kind of explains and you know general comment like the convention itself is addressed to states it explains to states what this digital environment means and what priorities they need to take and how all the different rights in the convention actually have some uh, are in some ways kind of reconfigured or, or transformed by uh, the digital infrastructure which um, many people here are now holding on to and uh, uh, is, is, is so um, important to our lives. The, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the process of producing a general comment. I knew absolutely zero before I started saying it's time that the Committee on the Rights of the Child said something about the digital world. Um, but I think actually we went through a fairly kind of classic process of um, beginning with a day of general discussion um, with the committee um, putting out a concept note, having a, a, a global consultation when... Uh, various experts and governments wrote in 
Um, my colleague Amanda Third led um, Our Rights in a Digital World, which was a global children's consultation, and that was um, a major effort in the countries that are um, uh, highlighted in black on the map. We tried very hard to uh, design a consultation process that would engage children and young people. Children and young people were delighted to participate. It was something they felt they had a lot to say on, something they felt they were um, uh, expert on very often, and indeed they wanted access to digital technologies to be a right. Um, uh, the way we um, put it in the end is that it is uh, increasingly the means by which young people exercise their rights. And so in that sense, um, digital technology is playing this, this, this crucial role. Um, nonetheless, I am slightly nervous at trying to do a bit of tech, but I will, um, because I'm not going to tell you what's in the uh, general comment, but we made a lovely video of kids doing so. So um, I'm just going to play part of it and hope it works. So I'm very tempted to carry on, but I'll stop it there. Um, I think you can... Um, so so the, te the, the text was workshopped with children. I mean, clearly they're reading a script, but the, the text shop 
text was workshop with children, um, and this was their version of, of the general comment. Uh, I've been hearing all of those um, uh, articles of the convention with that kind of, you know, how, how are we going to make that work in, in the digital world? And I, I just now want to kind of shift into some of the challenges. And I'm thinking about what it is that states can do and what it is that businesses can do uh, to, to begin to make what, what those um, children and young people said kind of real. Uh, and I'll, I'll start with um, going back to the Facebook files and the idea that there are not only uh, challenges produced um, by living in a digital world because people are living in a more complex way, but um, this technology is being uh, designed by and large for profit. It's being designed in ways that are incredibly complex and it's being called, if you like, risky by design. It's not accidental that the digital world is causing a lot of challenges and difficulties for children and young people. So there's been a lot of talk recently about um, how algorithms are pushing young people down kind of rabbit holes on Instagram or on TikTok where they... Um, it's not anymore, you know, and this is a, a mental shift I think we all need make, that digital experiences are not anymore just what I, what an individual chooses to look at, a site they choose to go to, content they decide that they want to um, engage with. It's, now it's coming at us. It's, you know, the, the internet has been uh, transformed, um, if you like, from a pull to a, a push technology. And um, uh, the, in the attention economy and in the data economy, what it is you see when you go online is not the same as what the person sitting next to you sees, and what young people see is not necessarily um, the same as each other. And uh, the risky by design means that many of the difficulties that people have um, get kind of amplified uh, online and um, the profit motive is what's driving it. So just to kind of note, you know, in, in the... Um, why am I stuck in this mode? Can I get out of this mode? No. Because I'm not on full screen anymore. Uh -huh. Maybe it doesn't matter. Oh, my man is going to come and help me. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why I got stuck there, but thank you so much. So the, um, so the so this was the kind of tricky thing that, in writing the general comment, we tried to. Um, uh, I can I can work with it if it's need be. No, no, can I just you okay. carry on talking. Um, so. <laughs> but you're going through my slide now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that... Don't worry, I'm going to carry on. You can, they can see it. All right, so... All right, challenge the tech. Technology is often opaque and difficult to manage. Uh, <laughs> this, is, um, this is what we all know, and um, it is for young people too. Okay, so um, this is a couple of paragraphs from the um, uh, General Comment 25, and it reminds us that as, just as states have to um, uh, protect children um, online um, and violations um, in their rights online, offline, so it must um, also online. And this means paying attention to the design and operation of services. It doesn't just mean as perhaps we have thought for the last um, 20 years. It means um, advising parents and advising schools and advising young people to kind of act sensibly and protect themselves, though that's all good advice, but it really is time to shift to recognising that those behind the screen and operating the, um, the digital, um, uh, the whole kind of digital um, uh, economy uh, have significant uh, design uh, responsibilities. And so there's now much more talk in addition to advising the public on getting standards of ethics and privacy and safety right so that as, as the technology is first designed, people think about children's rights, people think about human rights, people think about um, the potential for um, algorithmic discrimination or um, pushing hostile content at um, uh, children and young people. And my quotes that you've now seen <laughs> mm. are from a project that I'm just doing that illustrates some of that with um, young people with, um, um, who are mental health service users or with um, mental health difficulties. And we've been asking them about their, um, their 
uh, digital experiences precisely to understand, if you like, what their particular journeys might be through digital, uh, the digital world and what particular needs they might have that are exacerbated by the nature of the technology. So, um, so this, is, this is, in a way, you know, that sense of the rabbit hole. Um, here is a young, uh, a young woman with uh, mental health problems. She watches sad videos on TikTok. And then what she gets is more and more pushed at her. And she comes to think she lives in a sad world in which everyone is... Um, um, and I, 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 in a way, this is a very sad quote because she, she says, I question myself, I realise I've done this to myself because there's a crisis in my own head. Um, and of course, she has, I mean, she, she's, she's made some choices about what to watch, but it has been also done to her. And um, I think the focus really now is beginning to get to be um, on, on those who design um, that world. Um, here's a, a, a young boy, a 14 year old boy. He's an excess, obsess, excessive gamer, as he describes himself. Um, and while he's gaming, he's chatting on Omegle, which um, you may or may not know is a kind of anonymous, um, quick fire kind of um, find someone and, I don't know, chat them up or hate them. Um, and he's on this anonymous app. Um, and, um, you know, he's learning and he's kind of struggling with it, but it's a difficult app. And again, it has been designed to be anonymous, to be quick fire, to be um, uh, uh, familiar. Um, as he says, he's had some pretty weird um, experiences. Um, here's a, a, another young woman um, uh, with a um, suicidal level of anxiety, describing to us seeing content with um, super hostile um, and abusive um, images. And, you know, again, her last sentence there is very telling. Um, we tell Snapchat that this is happening, but they don't do anything. So I think it's kind of really crucial in, in, in relation to digital technology to... Um, Think about realising children's rights to safety and um, appropriate treatment according to their evolving capacities and recognition of the ways in which they um, may or may not be particularly vulnerable. Um, and it was important, I think, to, to hear the voices of, of vulnerable young people. Um, because what they say is we design for the average, the typical, or the market. We don't, we don't, we don't design for those young people. Um, or they give up, put up their PR person who says, actually, we're doing all we can. We're trying very, very hard. Snapchat is trying very, very hard, um, but not realising children's rights in the digital world. So um, this is where I think things are taking an interesting turn. So back to the... Um, general comment where states, you know, now we see states have got to do something and the question is what are states going to do to protect children from an endless stream of sad videos or images of naked children or guns or, or um, whatever might um, uh, be harmful for them. Uh, and one of the, uh, there are all kinds of ideas and Britain at the moment I, don't, I, I think here too is um, engulfed in a debate about uh, an online harms bill which maybe is going to um, find Mark Zuckerberg if he ever lands his plane in Heathrow. Um, but um, there are some real challenges for governments in how to do it and how to do it at scale because the scale of the, of the problems has become uh, very huge. So I wanted to point out a couple of things that uh, were in the general comment that seemed to me very important. One is that as states protect, they seek to protect children from harmful and untrustworthy content, they must do so in line with Article 13, with the child's right to information, with the child's right to um, expression, sorry, um, the child's right to um, explore and be in that world. They cannot do it by just keeping children so safe that they can't find out anything and do anything. And secondly, they must do it, um, and then the general comment recommends age verification systems, um, which will uh, manage um, what children see, um, and they must do that in a way that is privacy protecting. So I've been part of a project uh, in the last year or so, which is trying to think about 
um, bringing in age verification. This is a, U a European project, uh, and I and a couple of colleagues are to, there to ensure that it's done in a child rights respecting way, and it's a challenge. So imagine that you're going online, whoever you are, um, and you're going to do whatever you want to do. Um, at the moment, the companies will say they have no idea if you're a child or an adult, if you have mental health difficulties or, you have, um, uh, or, or you're robust and resilient, um, whatever. Um, they have no idea if you have anyone uh, there to help you. They don't know if you have parents or if you're a refugee. Um, so they treat you all the same. This is what they um, say. Uh, and so the answer has become, and I think is becoming, um, there will now have to be some kind of barrier for risk content which is going to um, test, uh, check people's age, as there is when you go to a shop and buy pornography or a knife or indeed um, a bottle of whiskey. Uh, there's, there's some kind of age. This is now, I think, going to come in online. And the question, and I think it's going to change the internet, actually. I think it's going to change it for all of us. And it seems at the moment to be the only way of kind of managing the internet in the best interests of children because if you don't know who's a child you have I, I think the the original thought was if you don't know who's a child well let's ask them are you 14 or 17 but in fact if you don't know who's a child I have to ask everyone in this room uh, are you uh, what age are you to know who is the child anyway so you see so I think it is actually becoming quite an interesting um, uh, moment and we'll see if it plays out there is an enormous pushback uh, from um, uh, the civil liberties, um, the, the, those uh, holding the um, moral compass for the, uh, the free and open internet, uh, from um, uh, the privacy, all, all of those concerned with privacy, which of course um, uh, I'm sure everyone here would include themselves in. So there's, 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 there's a kind of a clash, uh, and we will see how it goes on. It was also very interesting for me being part of this group, because I found myself... Uh, talking to people designing the system and, for age verification and of course those are engineers and software developers and they have no idea about child rights and they have no idea about um, any of the things I might say like don't build in any kind of parental consent process unless you have a mechanism uh, for children who don't have a helpful handy parent by their side. Um, and anyway, how do you know who is the parent? And it turns out, actually, they don't. Um, or don't bring, bring, bring in anything which is going to collect more data than is necessary and invade everyone's privacy, including children's privacy, which um, uh, we could be uh, concerned about. So I don't know how it's coming out, but you've probably already begun to see some kind of age checks on your online um, interface. And I think you can expect more, and it, we're, we're in, in the point of a bit of an interesting experiment, I think. So you can't read this, um, <laughs> but um, this is what's written in the general comment about privacy. Um, and in the end, uh, privacy for children, and indeed for everyone, kind of became a really pivotal uh, debate in producing the general comment and thinking about children's rights in the digital age. So children see access to technology as the means through which they exercise their rights, and I agree with them. Um, but I think many others also see privacy now as the means through which we access our rights. Um, and so this was one of the points on which there were most contrary views um, and lots of, um, lots of difficulties also in implementation. Um, so here is my kind of quick crib on what it says, um, just so you kind of get a sense of, in the end, it became the longest section um, because there was quite a lot to say about how digital technologies are potentially enabling, but very often infringing, children's rights in all kinds of ways. Um, and I, 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 of course I haven't heard all the papers at, at, at this conference, but just thinking about all of those digital apps for children's health and well-being or use of um, uh, remote learning technologies or um, gamified technologies for uh, health information or whatever it is that people are developing, 
what happens to that data and what the kind of commercial business model might be behind it and the um, potential for children's data to go out in um, uh, unexpected directions um, is really crucial. And you can see that in here there are questions about um, the importance of privacy, about um, how technology is becoming the means of surveillance when there are um, I haven't checked this room for CCTV, but um, you know now you go into a nursery or a school or a youth centre and uh, there is a lot of surveillance going on, um, perhaps more in Britain than in Ireland, I don't know. Um, so in a way, some of this is kind of thinking about the GDPR, some of this is thinking more broadly. Um, there, is a, there was a strong desire that children should not be routinely uh, surveilled by technology any more than by um, parents or staff, um, and that sometimes children need uh, anonymity and privacy from their parents, particularly when help-seeking. And uh, this will resonate with you, but I can tell you it was a big... Um, it's, a, it's a source of argument, um, and inclusive, including in relation to the GDPR. And here. So, got my eye on time, good. So I just want to point out, um, and there are so many directions I could take this in now, but just staying on privacy. I think adults are giving um, young people a very peculiar um, sense of what's happening. So I particularly love this advert from Facebook. It dates it now. It's two years old, I think. That says, we all have, a, we, we at Facebook love respecting your privacy. Um, and if you want to say that only me is how you want to keep your data, then that's an option on Facebook. Personally, I haven't found it. Um, <laughs> but um, the idea is somehow that as a privacy-protecting company, um, uh, they, they will allow you to keep the data to only you. What they do mean is you can prevent other people in your personal circle from seeing it, but what you can't do is prevent Facebook from seeing it, and Facebook is selling it. So I was just going to tell you a little game that we played with kids to see if they cared because there's a line out there that says kids don't care about their privacy because they think, um, and we, we, we did some kind of, uh, uh, as you can see. What became very meaningful to me was distinguishing when we talk about privacy between what it is that your friends or your teachers or others can see, um, what it is that your school or your doctor can see, and what it is that companies um, can see, and the idea, of course, that there are many things they want to keep to themselves. The idea that their web browsing is being um, uh, datafied and monetized is quite um, horrifying. Um, so there are, um, yeah, so we, um, so in the end, um, we found kids care a lot about privacy, and they want a lot of, they want to know a lot of things about their data online, and they want to change a lot of things about their data online. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you our little video that we made, but we did build them a toolkit to kind of try to explain um, where their data goes. In my last couple of minutes, I just wanted to say something um, positive about um, play um, and the importance of being able to play uh, freely online as offline because I think for many the idea of children paying freely online um, has become something of a nightmare. It becomes identified with addiction uh, or with um, time wasting or with screen time um, and so the general comment tries to kind of separate the values of play uh, from um, the commercial um, exploitation of children. Um, and in our own work, we uh, did a youth consultation uh, to gather, as it were, all the ideas about play and what play is and could be and should be, especially free play, um, and uh, then try to take that as a set of design standards to the industry so that the digital world might be um, better developed. Um, the image that worked best in our child consultation was the image of a cardboard box, the little girl um, on the bottom left. Uh, and if you ask anyone, actually adults or child, to talk about playing with a cardboard box, you get all their images of free play in its very best form. And our question became, how can we find that kind of cardboard box possibilities uh, online? 
and to cut a long story very short, um, we came up with some seven design standards. This is a new way of thinking for me. I'm not used to thinking about design standards. But we came up with some design standards that we could say to the industry, at least those who want to do it right, who want to um, build a, uh, a better world for children, these are the things that children say they want. These are the things that experts will say are good for children. And let's at least begin a conversation about how we can uh, develop and build that, um, that world that is not risky by design, but playful by design. Uh, so we're now workshopping this with designers, and um, more will come. Um, and in my last minute... <laughs> being closely watched. Um, I just want to make a comment about the best interests of the child because I think in a way this is our concept that brings everything together. Uh, and in Britain it has found its way, which sadly has not, um, let me be careful, um, has not um, incorporated the <coughs> convention into law, though I know there are efforts in, in Scotland. Um, uh, but we have put it in our Data Protection Act in relation to privacy, which is kind of interesting as a kind of add-on to the GDPR, um, where the best interest of the child has suddenly become a mantra on the lips of many folk in the tech industry who now say, oh, yeah, we do best interest of the child. Yeah, we've thought about best interest. We've provided for that. Um, but actually, it's, it's a radical um, provision in the... Uh, convention, and I think it's really crucial as we uh, as it's been translated into the uh, general comment 25 on how the best interest of the child might look in a digital world where you don't know who is a child, though you might be soon going to bring in age verification. Footnote: Of course, they actually know an awful lot about us and who we are, so maybe they do know who is a child. Um, but the ch what that child's best interests are, and what the best interests of children collectively. Um, is, I think, um, the big debate to come in relation to the digital world. Um, there are some positive efforts. Um, this is a US coalition that formed in the last few months of many of the children's and young people's <coughs> NGOs and kind of rights organisations that are trying to say, OK, let us now think how can the digital world be designed for children and their best interests in mind. There are some um, hostilities, not that, well, I'll leave my comments on the cult on my, our culture secretary for another day. But um, nonetheless, I note that um, our efforts to bring in an online safety bill mean that, okay, we're just going to turn the whole of the internet into a childish and for children zone, and um, adults will have to go to the dark web. Um, this is the new debate. Now, um, Meta and many others are building the metaverse. Um, so we're still debating tech now while they are planning tech for tomorrow. And um, I um, very much hope that um, uh, I've given you a bit of inspiration to think critically about the tech and um, imaginatively <coughs> about what it could be as well as uh, realistically about what it is at the moment. Um, and I do think there are some signs from um, governments, policymakers, and um, the industry itself to begin to make some changes, but they may be too little too late. Who knows? I'm an academic. I have to end pessimistically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.